Hey, welcome everybody. I'm uh, Eric Zach. I'm filling in for uh, Jeannie Castine today here at Secular AZ. Um, today's guest is uh, Mary Beth O'Connor. Uh, Mary Beth is a board member for Life Ring Secular Recovery and She Recovers Foundation. Uh, she speaks on behalf of these foundations about multiple paths of recovery, uh, about all topics related to substance use, disorder, and recovery. Uh, professionally, six years into recovery, uh, she attended Berkeley Law, uh, working with a large law firm in Silicon Valley. She litigated cases for the federal government and in 2014 was appointed uh, federal administrative law judge, a uh, position from which she retired in 2020. Uh, beginning with alcohol at age 12, she spent several years abusing various drugs, working her way up to methamphetamine at 16 and shooting up at 17. Uh, but then uh, by incorporating ideas from multiple sources, she built a secular uh, recovery plan that works for her. She's been sober since 1994. And her award-winning memoir, From Junkie to Judge, uh, is the winner, is the silver award winner of the 2023 Nonfiction Book Awards and is available on Amazon and other retailers. Uh, so Thank you for joining us today, and I will uh, welcome Mary Beth O'Connor. Thanks for having me. I just like you to see my face before I become a little box in the corner when I'm sharing my uh, PowerPoint, but I will do that now. All right, so um, I'm going to talk my story, as you heard, what I call my story is from junkie to judge. Um, Recovery Without God was the original subset, although that changed, but it's still a big focus of my book. Um, today, I'm going to tell you my story in brief. I'm going to go through the basics, like what actually is substance use disorder. I'm going to give you some tips and some guidance, talk about treatment options, peer support options, talk about the obstacles to choosing a secular program. I'm going to provide some resources, and there definitely will be time for Q&A at the end. Uh, so I see the short version of my story is child abuse led to childhood addiction, and that is actually a very common story. Um, I was actually left for six months, um, my first six months at a convent. I didn't live with my family. And later I lived for three years with a great grandmother. My mother was really not bonded to me, not focused on me, not particularly interested in me. Um, but um, and she she could be violent at times, but things got much worse when she married my stepfather when I was nine. And he was very violent with her. He was physically, sexually violent with me. It was just the kind of household where, you know, it was just a lot of stress and strain. You never knew what was going to happen to you. What I did and um, and the consequence of that, that, they were not closely related. I mean, I could do the same thing 10 times and it was fine. And the 11th time, it was like the worst thing anybody had ever done. And I, I get a real beating for it. The, the stress was so bad. I, I like to use a little example. When I was nine and my sister was seven and I realized who I was dealing with and my stepfather, um, we had a, one of our chores was to put the dishes away from the dishwasher to put them in the cabinets. And I taught my little sister to put the dishes away one dish at a time so they didn't clack. Like that was the level of strain. And so when I found my first drug, which was alcohol, it was when I was 12 and it was Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill wine, which a lot of people know. Um, and what I noticed about that first experience was how much better it made me feel. I, I really felt like my muscles sort of relaxed in a new way, like I could take a deeper breath. I was giggling with my girlfriend in sort of a more openly joyful way. And that really captured my attention. You know, this is a really positive experience. I need more of this. And so I pursued alcohol right away. I was looking for opportunities to drink, making opportunities to drink. I would even steal beer from my dangerous stepfather because that's how much I wanted it. But I also quickly added in other drugs. I added in weed. Um, I did pills. There were a lot of downers around, some stimulants. I did a lot of acid my sophomore year of high school. And when I was 16, I found what became my drug of choice, which was methamphetamine. And I was shooting meth within six months at 17 years old. I was in full bore addiction when I graduated from high school. 
I, I did do better in college for the first couple years. And, um, you know, better and good are two different words, but it was better. It was much worse than my peers, but for me, it was an improvement. I mostly used alcohol, sometimes cocaine, which was new to me, sometimes pills, sometimes hallucinogens, mostly on the weekends, sometimes it rolled into the week, always chaotically, always excessively, always with, you know, crazy behaviors. I hung out of a window one time and I had to get dragged back in. I mean, you know, a lot of chaos, but better. But I had a really um, life-threatening uh, kidnapping and rape, three men, six hours. Um, and then I moved in with a violent boyfriend. And it was sort of like the little grip that I had, I lost. And I started using meth again on a regular basis in January of my senior year. So, um, and I did not get sober until I was 32. So it was a really long haul. During those last 10 years, you know, by 32, I was really starting to have physical impact of all that toxic meth that I was pumping into my body. I was really feeling trapped and debilitated and hopeless. I couldn't hold a job um, because I couldn't get there. I couldn't focus. And my partner was ready to throw me out. So it was sort of everything in combination that made me finally say, you know, what if I go to rehab? <laughs> Um, and so I did. I went to a longer term women's program. It was a 90 day minimum, although I stayed for longer than that. Um, and in my mind, I'm going in for medical treatment. But I found out on the first day that my rehab was a 12 step only house and 12 steps is Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, and all of the anonymouses are 12 step programs. And the way I found out was because on um, in my rehab every day, they would do a step study. So they would read one of the 12 steps, and then we would either read the section in the AA big book about that step or in the Narcotics Anonymous text about the step. And then we would have a conversation. And on my first day, it was step three, made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the God of my understanding. Um, and so during the discussion section, I raised my hand and I said, you know, what about me? I'm um, I'm an atheist. And they they did say it doesn't have to be God. It can be any higher power. But I said, you know, but I don't believe in a higher power. Um, and then when I looked into the steps and the program more, I raised questions about, you know, I, I wasn't going to turn over my will in my life. I didn't agree I was powerless. Um, I wasn't happy about the focus on defects. It just wasn't a good fit for me. And I would raise questions and I was told vehemently and adamantly and repeatedly that if I didn't follow that program, I was going to fail because there was no other option. I was told my best thinking had gotten me there, to which I would always respond, I promise you it wasn't my best thinking. Um, but there was just a lot of pressure to conform. And so that was a real shock to me. I wasn't anticipating it. And I was really um, sort of dumped out of like, what am I going to do here? Because I believe them. This is 1993 I went to rehab. They said there was nothing else. These are the experts. I believe them. And so I thought, well, well what am I going to do? And so what I decided was to sort of keep my mind and my ears open and to look for the parts I could use and just ignore everything else. And so, you know, I did all the homework in rehab and they taught some useful things. They taught us things like how to handle and recognize triggers, a little bit of the science of addiction. There was some, a little bit of therapy, you know, recommendations like build up a clean, a sober network of friends and supports. All those sounded like good ideas. I did read all of the AA big book and I read all of the NA text and I was sort of looking up for, are there any key ideas here that I can use? I mean, I found some, I mean, there's a, an idea in 12 steps one day at a time, um, to, you know, to take your sobriety one day at a time. And in the beginning, I found that helpful. If I was having a bad craving day, I would say, you know, I'm not deciding for tomorrow, but for today, I'm not going to use. Um, and then I looked at that powerless step again. You have to agree you're powerless over your addiction, which I didn't agree, but I thought about it. And I decided, well, what I can agree is that I am powerless to moderate. <laughs> like there's no moderating for me. Um, and so that's what I did at first. I tried to just sort of pull the parts I could use. But I really, you know, vacillated between some hope that I could recover like everybody else and really fear when faced with the universal consensus that I could not. 
And so when I got home from rehab, and now it's January of 94, I thought, is it really true that there's no other options? And I will emphasize for the younger people that it's 94 and there's no Google, okay? There's no Google. So I got in my car and I drove to the library and it turned out even in 1994, it wasn't true. There were options. And so I found Women for Sobriety, which I'll talk about. That's the first modern secular option. I found the parent organization to what today is smart recovery. I found the parent organization to what today is life ring secular recovery. And so my first reaction was like, just relief, right? like, okay, other people have done it other ways. And so that helped relieve some of my anxiety and fear when I was being told that I had to do it one way when it was a way that wouldn't work. Um, but I actually can, did never uh, adopt fully any one of those programs either. I tackled it the same way I did with 12 steps. I read all the books. I went to meetings for all the programs and I was synthesizing. I was pulling the ideas that I thought would help me and applying them. Um, and so today, Life Ring would call that building a personal recovery plan, but that terminology didn't exist then. But but that's what I did. I just, I applied the tools, the techniques, the strategies that I thought would be useful for me. Um, and I have been sober since 1994. I had 30 years of continuous sobriety in January. But I also really had to deal with my trauma. So like many people who, get, who go into um, substance recovery, uh, I had um, I had mental health issues. I had PTSD and I didn't know it. I had, which for me really showed up as severe anxiety. And I had to address those issues simultaneously in order to really build a solid foundation and to ever have any hope of being, you know, living a happy and productive life. In fact, it took me many years longer to deal with my trauma recovery than it did with my substance recovery. And that is also very common. My legal career, because I do say from junkie to judge, um, I actually went to law school right out of college. I went to Berkeley Law. But remember, I started using meth again in January of my senior year. So by the time I got to law school in the fall, I was in no shape to do it. I mean, I couldn't get there. I literally would miss weeks at a time and I couldn't concentrate. And so I, I gave back a top 10 law school because of my addiction. I, I withdrew because I knew I would never be able to finish. And that was agonizing for me. I, I hated driving by that building. It was a horrible, horrible pain. And I knew it was because of my substance use. I knew it. Um, so I spent the next 10 years after, after that, working my way down the corporate ladder, is my terminology, because I couldn't hold a job. So every job was less money and less responsibility. So when I got sober at 32, I had a, a Berkeley degree and actually good grades, but I had an embarrassing resume. Uh, but I also wasn't really ready for a career job. Plus, nobody was going to hire me <laughs> for a career job. So I started where I was. Um, I, you know, My first job when I got home from rehab was a part-time, temporary, low-level administrative job. Because for me to get up every day and go to work on time and stay all the hours and do a good job and do it the next day and the next, I was 32 and I had never done that in my life. So I needed practice, you know, getting that sort of habit underneath me. And then my second job was a full-time permanent mid-level administrative job. My third job was a supervisory job by a larger company where I got a promotion. And then at six and a half years sober, I went to Berkeley Law for real. <laughs> Um, and then after I graduated, I worked at a big law firm in Silicon Valley. And then a few years later, I went and worked for the federal government doing class action work. And in 2014, and I emphasize at 20 years sober, I was appointed a federal administrative law judge um, from which I took early retirement in 2020. 20, 2020. Um, today, um, my husband says I need to look retirement up in the dictionary because I don't know what it means, but this is what I do. Um, I'm on the board for Life Ring Secular Recovery. I'm on the board for She Reco um, Recovers Foundation. I'm on the advisory council for the Higher Calling Foundation. My memoir is out, From Junkie to Judge, One Woman's Triumph Over Trauma and Addiction. It is, um, it is on Amazon and all the usual sites. And 30% of the book is about my first three years of recovery, building a secular recovery program. I didn't see any other memoir that was talking about do, doing recovery other than the 12 step way. So I felt like, you know, there was sort of a, a gap in the literature and I wanted to um, have, uh, I thought my book 
could fill that gap by showing an alternative um, way to get sober. Um, I've had essays published uh, there on my website, which is junketedjudge.com. I had an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal called I Beat Addiction Without God. I have had pieces in Recovery Today and others about getting sober um, without 12 steps. And today, as you know, I'm a speaker. Um, I speak at all kinds of conferences. I do workshops. I train lawyers and judges for continuing ed. And I, uh, and I do podcasts, radio, television. And some of those are on my website as well. So that's me. All right, substantive presentation. So you may have noticed that I usually say substance use disorder instead of addiction. That is the modern terminology. I will sometimes say addiction, partly because it's shorter, um, but um, the reason for the terminology change is that substance use disorder puts it in the medical box where it belongs. So substance use disorder is in the, um, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual that psychiatrists and therapists use for categorizing mental health conditions. Um, and it's the terminology is a person with a substance use disorder, just like it would be a person with anxiety or a person with diabetes. That's the term. The other thing is that in my 30 years of sobriety, the definition of substance use disorder has changed. It used to be really primarily focused, let's just say for alcohol. Um, oh, by the way, every time I say drug, I always mean including alcohol. Okay? Alcohol is a drug. It is still the number one abused drug in America. And even despite the overdose epidemic that you've probably heard of, uh, alcohol still kills more people than all the other drugs combined, except for cigarettes. So when I say drug, I mean including alcohol. Uh, but when I got sober, the focus was primarily on consumption, like for alcohol, how many uh, drinks do you have a day? How many days a week do you have over this many drinks? And that's still considered for severity as a factor among others. But the fundamental definition is focusing in a different place. And so, for example, the National Institute of Drug Addiction defines substance use disorder as a chronic relapsing disorder characterized by compulsive drug seeking, continued use despite harmful consequences, and long-lasting changes in the brain. And SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, defines it as recurrent use of alcohol and or other drugs, which causes clinically significant impairment, including health problems, disability, and failure to meet major responsibilities at work, school, or home. So the focus is on the consequences. It's continued use despite these consequences. That's the fundamental definition of whether someone has a substance use disorder or not. Um, the other thing is that you probably have heard people say that um, substance use disorder addiction is a disease. And some experts do categorize it that way. But it is actually under debate within the expert community. And so another way of looking at it is that it is a type of learning disorder. And that analysis, for example, can be seen in Maya Salovitz's Unbroken Brain. Another way of looking at it is that it's sort of our natural habit formation run amok. And that analysis, for example, is in Mark Lewis's Memoirs of an Addicted Brain. But regardless, today, um, addiction, substance use disorder is categorized as a mental health disorder. It is a type of brain disorder. All right. So another thing that's changed um, in my 30 years is the way we think about uh, the severity. So when, when I when I went into rehab, what I was taught was that one day it was we crossed this invisible line, right? We went from drug abuser to drug addict. We didn't know what day it was, but one day we crossed that line. But that's not how um, it's thought about today. So the the way that um, that it's viewed is that substance use disorder is on a spectrum. You can have a mild, moderate, or severe substance use disorder, just like you can have mild, moderate, or severe anxiety, or mild, moderate, or severe depression. So it's really about where do people fall on that spectrum. And the related idea is that hitting bottoms, I'm sure many of you have heard people don't get well until they hit some horrible bottom. Well, that is neither true nor necessary nor recommended. First of all, hitting bottom was always retrospective. It was never objective. It wasn't like when you do A, B, and C, you've now hit bottom. 
it was always now that I have some stable sobriety, looking back, where was my worst point? Okay. But the problem is that people will can die waiting for the, you know, some horrible bottom, or they can suffer serious and irreversible health consequences. It also just creates more damage. The longer you wait to address your substance use disorder, the more years you've lost, probably the more jobs and relationships you've lost, the more you know financial hole you've gotten yourself into, all of those things um, are more likely to happen the longer you stay in active addiction. So the focus today is on trying to disrupt that substance use disorder cycle as early in the spectrum as you can. Like let's address it at the mild or moderate level rather than waiting for you to get to the most severe level. Now, don't get me wrong, when I take that DSM test, I fall in the you know, very severe end of that spectrum and I got sober. It's not that people can't, it's just that we encourage people in, in most programs, they'll try to help people to, um, to break the cycle, to get, to get their use um, to stop, get abstinent or get their use under better control earlier. It's to their advantage. The other um, new, one of the newer ideas is that quitting or, and I really emphasize, or reducing consumption can be beneficial even if you don't meet the substance use disorder criteria. So let's just take alcohol as an example. Moderate alcohol use has negative health effects. Okay, moderate use is one drink a day for women and two for men. Even at moderate use, your, your likelihood of getting cancer, having liver disease or heart disease goes up. For example, for women, um, the likelihood, the odds of getting breast cancer has, is notably increased even with moderate alcohol use. One drink a day raises your blood pressure. So there are negative health consequences even at moderate use. So reducing how much you drink or use other drugs can be beneficial even if you don't uh, qualify as having a substance use disorder. The other thing is that there can be behavioral impacts, right? So are you making risky choices under the influence? Are you driving under the influence or being a passenger in a car with someone who's driving under the influence? Are you regretting sexual decisions? Are you getting in verbal or physical altercations under the influence? These are all negative impacts that you might want you to cause to you to revisit um, the level of your consumption. Another example, are hangovers interfering with your work productivity or just interfering with you living your best life? Are you use, losing like half of every Sunday because you're, you're, you're hungover from Saturday night? Um, are you using alcohol or other drugs to avoid dealing with emotions? So um, you know, let's be honest, substances have a short-term beneficial effect, right? You feel more relaxed, you, 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 know, you can forget about your problems. Uh, if, it's, if you do that you know, once every couple months, it's not an issue, but if you're using the substance on a regular basis because you don't, you're not addressing the feelings that are underneath, the emotions that you're struggling with, you're actually doing yourself a disservice because the problem won't get solved until you deal with what's happening. Similarly, are you using a substance to avoid a problematic life situation? Are you, you uh, using it because you're angry at your husband or you're, you're unhappy at work or you know, you're stressed out because you have to help care for your parents? Whatever it might be, the substance isn't gonna solve the underlying problem. And so reducing um, uh, the substance use can be beneficial uh, even if you don't have a substance use disorder. Treatment options. So let me first say that for alcohol and benzodiazepines in particular, if, this, if the use disorder is, is um, significant, even maybe at the mild, but definitely at the severe level, uh, sometimes medically supervised withdrawal, detox, detoxification is necessary. You can die, people die. <laughs> from withdrawing from alcohol or benzodiazepines. Uh, people, alcohol, for example, you can have seizures. So if the use disorder is at the more severe level, people may um, be um, safer to go through medically supervised withdrawal. They will get drugs that will help reduce the risk. Um, and then for opiates, it, usually that's not a risk of death, but opiate withdrawal can be very painful. And so if people are um, given supervised withdrawal, they can be given craving reducers as well as uh, drugs that will reduce the, their pain, the physical symptoms. 
And that makes it less likely that they'll give up in the middle of the withdrawal and go out and use because they're they're so uncomfortable. They're in so much pain. And then inpatient. I'm sure most people have heard of 28 or 30 day programs for inpatient treatment. Um, let me first say that inpatient programs are not 28 or 30 days because the data shows that that's the optimal length of time. That's not what the data shows. It absolutely is not the optimal length of time. It's 28 or 30 days because if you're lucky enough to have insurance, that's what they'll pay for. Um, but the reality is that the data shows that some kind of supervision, some kind of um, uh, structure program for 12 to 18 months is actually better. It doesn't mean inpatient for 12 or 18 months, but some kind of structured plan. The other reality is that not everybody needs to go inpatient. If someone's at the mild or moderate level of a substance use disorder, they may not need inpatient treatment. But the other part of that is that even if people need it, they can't always go. Maybe they can't leave work. Maybe they're a single mother and have no one to care for their kids. But also, many people can't access inpatient even if they wanted to, because we don't in the U.S. have a robust system of readily accessible, affordable treatment. Many people can't afford it. They can't go. They don't have insurance and they don't have enough money. So it's not always an option on the table, even if it would be beneficial. But there are other options. And one of them is what's called intensive outpatient. So intensive outpatient typically is a program that is three nights a week for two or three hours in the evening. So people can live at home and they can keep their job and go to treatment at night. Um, also, there are other options. So today, there are more doctors and therapists with specific training on substance use disorder. There aren't nearly enough, but there are more. And so some people work with a doctor and or therapist rather than going into a more formal treatment program. There are also what's called recovery coaches or peer support specialists. So you can hire them and they will help you build your plan. You know, what, what am I going to do? Should I go inpatient? Should I do IOP? What's my plan? And they can help you um, uh, build the specifics of it. They can help you when you're during the process to overcome obstacles, when you're feeling, you know, ambivalent or when you're, you've fallen off track, a peer support specialist can help with that. There is today medication assisted treatment. So for alcohol use disorder and opioid use disorder, although not stimulants, there is medication that significantly reduces the risk of death and reduces the risk of relapse. So for example, for opiates, um, methadone or buprenorphine reduce the risk of a fatal overdose by 60%. And they, they, they also keep people more likely to keep on track, more likely to, um, to stay sober. There isn't anything for stimulants yet, but there are drugs that are under uh, being tested at this point, And there are some that are being used off label, but they aren't as the data isn't as strong as it is for opiates, for example. And then there are harm reduction techniques. Harm reduction is about meeting people where they're where they are. Harm reduction includes things like Narcan, uh, which is an opiate reversal drug. Um, if somebody's having an overdose, you spray it up their nose and it kicks the opiate off the receptor and they will revive. The other thing is if they're not having an overdose, it won't hurt them. And so I always recommend for people who have teens or 20 somethings in their house, at least you should have Narcan in your house. Um, but many people where I live in the Bay Area, we have it in our car. A woman saved a teenage boy in the town next door to me um, about two months ago because she had Narcan in her car. He was 17 and he was overdosing. So that's one example of harm reduction. Um, needle, uh, getting clean needles is another. I used the needle exchange um, my last five years of shooting meth. That way you don't get HIV or hep C or other bloodborne diseases. Um, and there are other options, other types of harm reduction. All right, peer support. So 12 steps is the biggest peer support option. Um, and, and let me first say, so 12 steps uh, basically is in pretty much every community for face-to-face -face meetings. And that is an advantage. Um, there, the other programs that I'm gonna talk about, they all have face-to-face -face meetings, but they don't have them everywhere. They're not in every community, but you can participate in all the other options online. And depending on where you live, you might be able to participate in person. But 12 steps is everywhere. 
Um, one of the, some of the key ideas of 12 steps are that belief in a higher power, agreeing you're powerless, you're going to turn over your will and your life, and following a very structured 12 step program. Now, I will first of all say that it isn't that there's this hard line where all the faith based people go to 12 steps and all the non faith based people go to the other options. There are atheists and agnostics that make 12 steps work for them. And there are a lot of religious and spiritual people in the other alternatives because they don't like 12 steps for reasons other than higher power. So it's really about looking at the, the philosophy of the, the program. At, at least I would recommend the six I'm going to present and looking at the meeting format and just finding what's the right fit. So 12 steps. Um, there's also Life Ring Secular Recovery, which I'm on the board for. We have what we call a 3S philosophy, sobriety, secularity, and self-help. So we believe that um, each person is in charge of their own recovery. It's self-empowerment based. And that my plan and the plan of the person sitting next to me will be different because we're different and unique people. So we need a plan that will work for us. Um, smart Recovery. They take a cognitive behavioral therapy approach. In a smart meeting, they're going to have other behavioral disorders in the same room, like eating disorders or gambling disorders. Some people like that and some people don't. So pretty much every aspect of every program, some people will like and some people won't. Um, and that's the good news is there's choices and they all have different mixes of different approaches. She Recovers Foundation. Um, I'm on the board for She Recovers. She Recovers isn't just for substance recovery. It's also for mental health recovery, trauma recovery, eating, grief, um, overwork, all together um, because those recoveries overlap. And in She Recovers, we focus on strengths, on, on, um, on the journey to wholeness. It's also self-empowerment based as is Women for Sobriety. Again, the first one I found, the first option to 12 steps, it is the first modern option to 12 steps. The goal of a, in Women for Sobriety is for the members to become what they call a 4C woman, capable, caring, competent, and compassionate. And they focus more on positive reinforcement. There is Recovery Dharma, which is Buddhist-based. Um, they focus on inner wisdom and an individual journey, and a lot of the meetings have a meditation uh, uh, aspect to it. And there are many others. These are really just the largest, but there are a lot of others. And there are some that are just local, that they don't exist nationally, but they're in local communities. And then there is none. 20% of the people who get long-term recovery actually don't use any peer support or any treatment program of any kind. Um, personal recovery plan. So that's what I did, right? I built a plan that worked for me as an individual. And today that is much more common. And um, a number of the alternatives do emphasize this. It's also official federal government policy that recovery um, treatment plans, recovery programs um, should be individualized to the, to the individual. So um, another way of talking about it is that it can be a patchwork or hybrid. So when you pull ideas from more than one program, like I did, Today, we call it a patchwork or a hybrid plan. And self-empowered discovery is really, just means you're designing your own program. It doesn't mean alone, right? Um, one of the things that I always emphasize is that asking for the help you think you need is a self-empowerment decision. And so if someone thinks they need professional help or they can benefit from peer support groups of whichever one, or they need inpatient treatment, that's a self-empowerment decision. You're doing the analysis and you're deciding what you need and you're going out and you're getting it. But there can be a lot of benefits to the self-empowerment approach, right? And one of them is self-knowledge. So really what you're doing is you're thinking about sort of like, who am I, where am I, where do I want to get to, and how do I think I can get there? It's really an analytical process. And building that individual plan can actually create a strong sense of ownership to the plan because you're not being told what to do, you're deciding. And that can help with resilience, right? If people are pushed off track or um, at risk of getting pushed off track, having that connection to the plan you designed can be useful. But it's also about just efficacy, right? Really for me, when I took control of my recovery, and remember I had destroyed most of my life, um, what I actually was doing was learning how to make decisions in all areas. It turned out that that same approach of where am I, where do I wanna go, where, how do I think I can get there, that analysis works for everything.
And so doing it as part of your recovery can be um, a skills building exercise. It's creating a sense of competence and confidence to handle life. And also plants need to be adjusted over time. And, and there's a couple of reasons. And one in particular is that usually, you know, we, we set our initial plan, right? Like for me, I picked, um, I had like so much to work on. I made a list. What do I need to work on? The list was way too long for me to work on like from the beginning. I had to prioritize. And so I picked five things. I picked my sobriety, my mental health recovery, um, trying to get back to work, my relationship with my partner, which was on its last string and trying to get my debt under control. And that was it. Like everything else waited. Um, but when I built my initial plan, then as I achieved my first goal, well, now I can set goal number two and plan number two and then implement that. And eventually I could start working on other things. So recovery plans are iterative and they, they need to be adjusted as time goes by. Um, there actually was a study that compared the different peer support groups. So it was in 2018, it's called the Peer Alternative Study. And it, um, oh, there's supposed to be a related study, it hasn't come out yet, say 2023, but it's not out. But the Peer Alternative Study called the PALS Study compared the eff uh, effectiveness of AA, Life Ring, Women for Sobriety and SMART. And it found that they're all generally equally effective. Um, there were some demographic differences, educational, financial, religious affiliation. Um, the members of the 12-step alternatives actually showed higher levels of satisfaction and cohesion, but basically they're equally effective. And so from my point of view, um, my goal is always to just tell people of what their options are so that they can do the research and find the right fit and increase their odds of success. Um, this also relates to there's a lot of data that shows that if you participate in building your mental health treatment plan, your odds of success are higher. And that should um, play out in substance recovery as well, since that is a type of mental health treatment plan. All right. Um, so why is it important to tell people about their options? One reason is, as I'm sure you know, the increase of religious nuns. And when, I, when I'm talking without the PowerPoint, I always say, I mean, N-O-N-E-S, not N-U-N-S, okay? But um, the increase of religious um, nuns in the U.S. The religious nuns are typically include atheists, agnostics, humanists, free thinkers, and others. And the studies I've shown have shown that 21 to 32% of the U.S. population is a religious nun. It, it can depend on how they define it. Sometimes they include the unaffiliated, but who, who believe in a God or higher power as a religious nun. Sometimes they don't. But the other thing is that the religious nuns, um, the they group has changed. So they used to be that they mostly lived in cities, but now religious nuns are showing up more broadly throughout the country. There's also an increasing diversity of age, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status of religious nuns. But despite that, there are actually a lot of obstacles to choosing a secular alternative. So, for example, um, there are there are about 40 percent of the treatment programs today still are a 12 step exclusive. And a lot of those don't even tell their clients that there are other alternatives. Um, that's pro problematic. To me, that's malpractice. You're, you're purporting to give medical treatment and you're not sharing all the relevant information. But also, even programs that aren't 12-step exclusive um, or that don't say they're 12-step programs, there are 12-step ideas that have gotten embedded in a lot of treatment program ideas that are without foundation. So, for example, um, the program might say that you have to have a higher power or a spiritual awakening to get sober, but they won't say that's a 12-step idea. They'll present it as if this is just a fact. When it isn't, it's not true. They may say you have to agree you're powerless. 12-step idea, not necessary. It can help some people to have that idea, but it's not necessary. Or they do this one size fits all. You know, this is the program. This will work for all of you. Or the, that idea of just do what we say and, and don't challenge us. Um, but so I, there's, a, there's an HMO in my area. I live in the Bay Area, uh, Kaiser. Um, and so there's a Kaiser in Oakland, which has is it absolutely multiple pathways. They have on-site meetings of 12 steps, um, life ring, women for sobriety, smart, and dharma, all on-site. There's a Kaiser 25 miles away 
on the peninsula, still in the Bay Area, where the guy who leads the program is adamantly 12 steps. And life, we had to work hard to even let our, get our members be able to qualify as graduating from the program because he insisted that people had to have a sponsor when they to graduate and sponsors are only 12 steps. So there can be a, a lot of challenges within treatment programs. Um, when I talk to people about when they wanna evaluate a treatment program, one of the questions I think should be asked is if they support multiple pathways. It's not that they need to have all the peer support meetings on site. Some facilities are just too small, but do they share the information? Do they at least let people know that there are other options? Another obstacle to choosing something other than 12 steps can be friends and family because friends and family often only heard of AA. And so if you say to them, I'm not gonna do AA, I'm gonna do Life Ring, or I'm gonna do um, Women for Sobriety, they can sometimes come back with, well, you're not serious about your recovery because you're not doing AA, you're trying to somehow wiggle out of this. Um, I actually hold a, a monthly meeting where friends and family can attend and I explain Life Ring and they can answer questions just for that reason. There are also legal obstacles to choosing multiple pathways. Every court decision that I know of that has looked at it has found that 12 steps is religious and therefore the government cannot mandate it. It can be an option, but it can't be mandatory, but it happens every day. Um, the Apigonomy Humanist Legal Center, the atheist um, legal group, they have fought these, but still it happens all the time. Courts will have, uh, if you have to go to meetings, peer support meetings, a lot of times the form that you have to get signed, it doesn't say peer support meeting, it says AA slash NA. And it's hard for people to push back when they're under the thumb of the judge or under the thumb of the parole officer or the probation officer, but it really comes up regularly in drug diversion cases, in sentencing, in good time sentence reduction. We had a life ring member who was in jail and people who attended AA got their sentences reduced for attendance and they wouldn't do it for life ring. So um, it's a problem. Probation, parole comes up there, can come up in family law as far as visitation with children or custody. So it's a major problem. It's an issue that we need to continue to fight. All right. Resources. So um, there are a number of sites you can go to for information. SAMHSA, the Substances and Mental Health, uh, uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, um, they have information about substance use disorder. Uh, they also have information about a variety of programs, including they have a list of peer support groups that include the ones I told you about today, plus others. They have, um, you can go to the SAMHSA site and put your zip code in and you'll get a list of treatment providers. Now they're not vetted, but at least it can give you a place to start. SAMHSA also has an evidence-based practices toolkit. You may be surprised to find that many treatment facilities aren't evidence-based. They don't follow the science. Um, sometimes when I rec talk to friends and family or people trying to evaluate treatment programs, one way you might do that is to read the evidence-based practices toolkit provided by SAMHSA. And from there, you can pick out questions to ask when you're talking to these treatment programs. Do you do this? Do you do that? Do you not do this? What do you do if somebody relapses? It can help you um, develop a list of questions that will be informative. There also is some research and data on the SAMHSA site, but the focus for research is more NIDA, National Institute on Drug Abuse, which is part of NIH, National Institute on Health. They have, um, their mission is to advance science, and there has been a lot more money spent on science related to substance use and recovery in the last 15 years. It's a lot more information we have, a lot more solid data, and you can find much of that on the NIDA website. Um, Arizona. Uh, I will say I went to your Department of Health Services. It's the worst uh, website of any state Department of Health Services that I've ever seen. It's really bad. <laughs> um, but they do, if you look for it, have a little bit of opioid and overdose information so you can find it. Maybe there's other information there that I missed, but um, I couldn't find it. Um, but Maricopa County um, and generally speaking, every county in the country has a, um, a department under their health and human services, either it's mental health or it's substance use specific, and they may, you call it addiction, so you can look for that. Um, Maricopa County site is actually fairly robust, has information, it has resources, it has some data. And it does have harm reduction services. Um, so things, um, they have information about how you can get Narcan, for example. And by the way, 
Narcan no longer requires a prescription. You can buy it over the counter and a lot of community organizations give it away if you um, can't afford it. It's about 50 bucks. All right, um, my contact info. So uh, first of all, you could forget my name. You can not keep this information. All you have to do is Google the junkie judge and you can find me. Okay, I'm very Googleable. Um, you can message me through my website. And if six months from now, you want to send me a message and say, Mary Beth, what were those peer support groups you were talking about? Feel free. I answer every message. Um, my website, junketedjudge.com, as I said, has my like my Wall Street Journal. I beat addiction without God um, op-ed and others. Has some podcasts, some radio and television interviews. I'm on Twitter at Marie Bethel underscore. And I actually don't argue on Twitter. <laughs> I provide new studies that come out, articles and other information. Um, and I'm also on LinkedIn. And then my book is available on Amazon and all the usual sites. Um, your local bookstores can have it or they can get it. And again, 30% of it is about the, taking that secular recovery approach. So it's um, particularly relevant to your community. All right, um, so now we have time for Q&A. Um, so feel free to ask, you know, anything that would be, uh, that, that's of interest or any further clarification. Thanks so much. That was an excellent uh, presentation. Very, uh, very informative. Uh, we have, um, a few, uh, questions in the chat already. Uh, first one I see here, uh, Pam Morrison Kellen asks, is there a secular version of codependence anonymous? Um, I don't know of a secular version of Codependence Anonymous, um, but I do know of secular friends and family versions. So, you know, Al-Anon is the 12-step version of friends and family support, friends and family of people with substance use disorders. And there are secular options for that. So LifeRing has friends and family, SMART has friends and family, Hazelden and others. Um, for the codependence, I would Google it and you may be able to find something, but I, I don't know off the top of my head. I'm kind of curious since we're on that subject. Uh, what about other non-chemical addictions like um, gam gambling anonymous, uh, sex anonymous? Uh... Um, so smart meetings include those gamblers and uh, you know gambling and sex and other things. And so does she recovers. They include those types of things as well. I I don't I don't smart may have specific gambling um, meetings. I think I've seen those, but in general, they're usually embedded inside the other meetings. I mean, because part of it is the belief that it's the same sort of brain system that's working um, and with uh, excessive gambling and excessive sex and other things. And so a lot, if you read, if you have those issues and you want to, for example, read the life ring book or the smart materials about how to um, work on that issue, it's probably going to be pretty relevant to you as well. Thank you. Uh, and Mars de la Tour asks, uh, what effect does decriminalizing or legalizing drugs have on substance use? Yeah, well, um, I'll just say, first of all, criminalizing has had no help at all. OK, so um, the reality is that we've had this war on drugs since the 70s and anybody who wants any drug can get them. OK, so it's failed in that way. Um, I just saw data that shows that in the last 25 years, there has been no notable reduction in substance use at all. Uh, but the other problem is that there are a lot of um, negative ramifications from criminalizing, right? You criminalize your, um, when somebody has a criminal record, they have problems getting a job, they can have problems getting housing benefits. You're breaking up families while the person is incarcerated, which has a negative effect on kids, but also it's ineffective. And I personally support decriminalization for personal use. And there's a couple of main reasons for that. I mean, I could give you a list, long list, but the short list is, <laughs> The federal government and most state governments recognize that substance use disorder is a disease or a brain disorder of some type, and yet you're criminalizing it. Well, that's a contradiction, okay? Um, on top of which, um, it costs much more money to incarcerate someone than it does to treat them. So today we have a half a million people in jail just for drug possession, not for any ancillary crimes, pure possession. You can treat three or four people for the same amount of money that you incarcerate one. And today we don't have enough treatment beds. We don't have enough harm reduction monies. So those monies would be better spent um, on other supports. In addition, we have a significant racial disparity in the way that we enforce our drug laws. 
White people and people of color use drugs at very similar rates, but the odds of a person of color getting arrested, incarcerated, the charges tend to be higher, felonies versus misdemeanor, the sentences are longer. For the same exact behavior, the person of color is paying a much higher penalty and much higher odds of being penalized, which to me undermines any even arguable legitimacy of the drug laws. So I, I believe in decriminalization for personal use and diverting those funds from jail and police and you know court systems and putting them into creating a more robust support system. Treatment supports, often you will also need other mental health support as well as a lot of times job support and housing supports. And, and Mars uh, also wanted to specify that she she wanted to know um, specifically what effect does decriminalizing uh, or legalizing drugs have on substance use disorders? So, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, so the best example of decriminalization that we have that actually lasted long. So, in in, in America, we had decriminalization in Oregon for 18 months and they got rid of it before they it even had a chance to play out. But in Europe, they're closer. So Portugal decriminalized drugs in the 90s, decriminalized personal you know, small amounts of possession on um, personal use. And but they didn't just decriminalize it. They again they created wraparound services, right? So if somebody was caught with uh, uh, substances, they were sort of put into this committee, they were offered treatment, they did harm reduction, they created employment supports, housing supports. The drug use rate became the lowest in Europe. The overdose death rate of Portugal still today, even though they're not funding that program as well as they once did, is still one of the lowest in Europe. The crime rate in general went down because there were fewer people using substances and they had more access to treatment. Decriminalizing also destigmatizes drug use. It makes people more likely to ask for treatment and less afraid to ask for treatment. So there are a lot of positives that I see from, um, from decriminalization and a lot of really harsh negatives from criminalizing um, drug use. Thank you. Um, I have a comment here from Pam that says uh, she's been glad to see groups handing out Narcan at festivals, at uh, music festivals. Um, yeah, so the other thing I'll say about the Narcan, which is related to the overdose epidemic, is that, you know, so we've lost in the last three years, each of the last three years, we had over 100,000 overdose deaths in the U.S. That's the first time we ever had more than 100,000, and we've had it for three years in a row. Um, and part of the reason for that is that the drug um, supply has been contaminated by uh, synthetic opiates like fentanyl and xylazine and others. Um, it used to be that almost everybody who died of a drug overdose was a long-term drug user, but today that group is about two-thirds of the deaths, but one-third of the deaths are more casual users, and it's because they don't really know what's in the drugs. For example, it's really nearly impossible in the Western U.S. to get pure heroin anymore. It's almost all of it is either partially fentanyl or 100% fentanyl. Kids are ordering drugs. They think it's, it's a pill that looks like an oxy. Um, or it looks like a Percocet and it's not, it's fentanyl. And so there is a much higher number of casual drug users that are dying. As another um, you know, sort of horrifying statistic, the number one cause of death in the US in the 18 to 35 age group is drug overdose. Overdoses have reduced the life expectancy in, of the US overall by over a year. Um, and so it's a significant problem and Narcan is it's not a, a long-term solution, but it's, you know, it helps people survive the overdose, but also having conversations with your teens and your 20-somethings. Look, I think it's important to share accurate information about risk, you know, accurate information about drug use risk. But the reality is that most, you know, a lot of the high percentage of teenagers will experiment with drugs. Most of them will never develop a problem, but um, so it, it's important to let them know there is actually, for example, with cannabis, these high, you know, uh, potency cannabis is actually have some risk of psychosis, right? It's not, a, it's not a hyper high risk, but it's risky. And the earlier you start, the riskier it is. So share accurate information, but also share techniques like don't use alone. You know, I mean, it, it, these kids are dying behind closed doors. Um, use with your, if you're going to use, do it in a group, have Narcan sitting there. And why do you all have to take it at once? Let one person take it. Let's wait a half an hour and see what happens. You know, like, I mean, there's a lot of practical techniques you can find online that are really important to trying to help these kids survive what is a riskier time for casual drug use. And I'm kind of curious, just as uh, what one um, 
what question you going back to your presentation you mentioned the uh spiritual approach to AA versus, you know, the secular approach. Um, I, was, I was kind of curious why, um, why so many healthcare providers, are, you know, why some of those healthcare providers are insistent upon the spiritual approach, even though it doesn't, um, why, why it's, even though there's no data backing it up or, or well, is there, any, or, you know, where, where does that, where does that come from? I mean, I will say it's not that there's no data supporting 12 steps. There are some studies that show 12 steps to be, you know, you know, there, there it has some level of effectiveness, right? I mean, it, it does. And um, and for some people, faith can be a, a positive factor in their likelihood. It's just not a mandatory factor. And part of the reason that it's a problem is that there aren't um there aren't like good national standards on who gets to run a treatment program or what the qualifications of the staff are. So particularly in some locations, you're most mostly getting people with lived experience. In other words, people who got sober in 12 steps, who really have little to no education about the, you know, the science of substance use disorder or the alternatives or any of that. And they're just teaching what they know. Um, whereas in some states now, these peer support specialists or recovery coaches, there are actually standards and they have to have, you know, they have to get like a, go through a six month program and actually get educated about things. And so that that um, that environment's more likely to be open to alternatives than one that's exclusively um, being staffed by people who have only their lived experience and not a lot of education outside of it. Okay, uh, well, we're almost at about time. Um, I just wanted to make a few uh, quick announcements. Next week we have, um, at, on this uh, Friday series, we have the, uh, County assessors, uh, county assessor uh, candidates. Um, if you're not familiar with the uh, county assessors, they uh, assess all the value on real estate and personal property that includes uh, religious properties, um, and making you know the county assessor make sure those those that tax exemptions are applied fairly uh, in accordance without showing any in accordance with the law without showing any favoritism to religious groups. So that, that's a, a interesting one to join. I think uh, coming up next Friday. And um, also, I wanted to introduce you to my colleague, Eddie, who just joined us, um, who is our development director. He's going to say a few uh, quick words here about what he does, and, um, and that should take us out. Hi, friends. Hi, Thank you so much, friends. Um, I'm hoping my, com my camera's working. Um, Super excited to have everybody here. This was an incredible call. Just want to remind everybody how important it is for all of us to join in and continue the education to bring speakers like the speaker for today uh, to continue all of us being uh, able to support this type of work. We need you. We need you to be a part of this. And you can be a part of that by donating to us and continuing um, to empower all of us to be able to uh, continue our work. You can find um, how to donate to us on Secular AZ. Um, uh, how to support slash donate. Um, and you can make a, a little donation or a big donation, either or. It helps us continue the work like this. Thank you so much for being a part of this fight. We have to continue the fight to um, be able to combat extremism. Thank you so much. Thanks, Eddie. And I'll address one more question I just saw in the chat. Uh, Pam wanted to know uh, if this is going to be available on our YouTube channel. And yes, uh, once we're done here, I'm going to upload this to YouTube. And um, yeah, you can look out for that in the next uh, 24 hours or so. Uh, and all of our past talks are available on YouTube too. Um, so uh, we're just at Secular AZ on YouTube. Uh, yeah, so thank you uh, very much, uh, very much, uh, Mary Beth. Um, this is a very informative uh, talk. And uh, Jeannie should be back next week to uh, facilitate our talks. And uh, in the meanwhile, I hope you, uh, as Mara says, register to vote by October 7th, of course. And um, like what you saw here. Um, the book is Junkie to Judge. And where, where can they find you online, Mary Beth? Uh, my website is junkietojudge.com, and that has a lot of information on it. OK, great. And uh, you can like and subscribe us uh, if you haven't already. So um, thank you for joining us today. And uh, have a great weekend, everybody. <laughs>